Welcome to our second uh, event for the summer semester of the Hillary Clinton Center for Women's Empowerment. Um, since it was World Refugee Day yesterday, I hope you remember, yesterday was World Refugee Day. So our event today will be under the theme of refugee and migration um, and gender. And we have uh, the tremendous honor of having Professor Sabi Ardalan speak to us this afternoon. She comes from the Harvard um, Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program, and I'm sure she will explain to you what a legal clinic is. She got her uh, JD degree from Harvard Law School and her undergrad degree from Yale, and she has clerked for several judges in the U.S. Uh, District Court of Appeals. So she's a practicing lawyer, a legal scholar, and her expertise for the last eight years has been legal advocacy for refugee and migrants in uh, the United States. And this afternoon she will speak, as I said, on gender, migration, refugees, and the perils of law. So give Professor Adelan a hand of uh, applause. In law school in the U.S., uh, we um, teach regular law classes uh, that are just purely theoretical, and we also teach practical classes, which um, allow students to actually represent people in their cases in front of courts um, and tribunals um, and help asylum seekers and refugees with their applications for getting status. Um, and that's part of the legal education in the U.S., Students get grades for doing that. It's part of their degree. Um, and they can spend 20 hours, up to 20 hours a week, each week, working with me in our clinic um, to actually uh, interview uh, asylum seekers to prepare their applications and then to accompany them to court, to speak in court, to argue for them, um, all under the supervision of a lawyer. Um, and that's the way in which they learn refugee law, in addition to the classroom uh, component where we teach them the theory. So they do the two at the same time, and it's a good way of actually getting to learn both the theory and the practice, so when they're done with law school, they can go and continue to represent people and have had the experience of already having done it under close supervision of lawyers. And today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what is refugee law, um, just to give you some basic background. My sense is some of you know something about refugee law, some of you may not know anything, so I just want to make sure everybody has sort of the same um, level of understanding about it. And then I'm going to talk to you specifically about um, asylum claims involving women and violence against women and how those have sort of, the history of those and what kinds of cases we see in the US, um, how the law has developed, and then some of the difficulties with bringing those cases. A lot of questions about um, fraud. Are people telling the truth? Are they not? How do you prove that? Um, what, what kind of case do you need to present for somebody to win refugee status in the US? Um, and also in Morocco, because it's, as I will talk about, the same refugee definition applies in the U.S. and here as well. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we're seeing in the U.S. in terms of um, our asylum system. And I've now been here in Morocco just two months, and I'm starting to understand a little bit what some of the challenges are in terms of the Moroccan asylum system. Um, and so I thought I could talk to you about sort of what I've learned about that as well, and then also um, hear from you sort of your sense of, of the situation here for refugees and asylum seekers. It'll be very helpful for me to hear your thoughts too. So I'm going to leave time for questions. And yeah. Okay, so refugee law. What is refugee law? Who can get um, refugee status? A refugee is um, somebody who has a well-founded fear of persecution in their home country who's been forced to leave their home country because of it. And it has to be that the persecution or harm, the serious violation of human rights that they fear, has to be on account of one of five reasons. So it can't just be for any reason that um, they fear that their rights will be violated or that they will be hurt in some way. They have to fear that their rights will be violated or that they will be hurt in some way because of either their race, their religion, their nationality, 
their membership in a particular group, and that could be something like your gender, your sexual orientation, your family membership, um, or your political opinion. So sort of the cases I think most people think about when they hear about refugees and asylum is somebody like a political opposition party who spoke out against a government and then had to flee the government had to flee the country because they were scared they would be tortured and they get asylum in another country. That's sort of the basic case that everybody, when you say refugee, thinks about is a political asylum seeker. But that's just one type of person who would be eligible for refugee status. As I'll talk about um, in a little bit, women who flee domestic violence are also eligible for refugee status. Um, and any country that has signed the Refugee Convention, the 1951 Refugee Convention, has an obligation under international law not to return somebody to their home country where they fear being tortured or persecuted if they have signed the convention. And the US and Morocco are both um, signatories. The US is a signatory to the 1967 protocol to the convention, um, which just kept the same definition of refugee, but um, took away some of their limitations on time and geography. And Morocco signed the 1951 Refugee Convention in um, 1956. It was the first country in this region to sign the convention. Um, and so the Refugee Convention is intended to provide protection to people when their own home country cannot provide them with protection. And it came, um, it came about after World War II um, when there was a failure of countries to protect their people. And so there was an international understanding that um, nations needed to provide protection to others when their own home country couldn't. Um, so the US incorporated this international convention into US law in 1980. So essentially, the definition of refugee that's in the International Convention, the 1951 Convention, we've taken that and put it directly into US law um, with some small changes, but pretty minor changes. Um, the international definition recognizes as a refugee somebody who has a fear of persecution in the future. In the US, we've changed the definition a little bit to recognize somebody as a refugee who has either suffered persecution or harm in the past or has a fear of persecution in the future. So arguably, our definition is a little bit broader, um, but it depends on who's interpreting it. Um, so as an advocate, I argue that it's broader. Um, and uh, we have also uh, incorporated into US law the non refoulement protection of the 1951 convention. So just as I said, any country that has signed the refugee convention has a legal obligation not to return somebody to a country where their lives would be in danger. And in Morocco, um, there's sort of uh, the refugee law situation is in transition. So some of you may have heard in 2013 there were announcements of a new migration policy in keeping with human rights and humanitarian principles. Um, the government has been busy trying to draft an asylum law to do what the US did, which is to incorporate this international convention directly into Moroccan law. And there's a draft law that has been um, discussed in various ministries, and it's supposed to be presented to Parliament um, at some point, hopefully, uh, in the near future. Um, and that law should ideally incorporate, just as um, the US has done, uh, the 1951 Convention definition of refugee. Um, already, Moroccan law recognizes certain rights um, for refugees as being a signatory to the Convention. So just having signed the Convention, Morocco is bound, just as the US is not, to return people who meet the definition to a country where there would be torture. Um, there are other legal provisions that also protect um, some refugee rights here in Morocco, like um, a law uh, for 0203 that had a lot of very restrictionist things related to migration, also had um, you know, at least some positive statements about um, not expulsing or sending out of the country refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and then Morocco is also a signatory to the African Convention, which has a broader definition of refugee than the 1951 Convention. 
Um, and so even though Morocco has suspended its activity with the OAU, the African Convention it's still a signatory of, um, and that definition of refugee, unlike the 1951 Convention definition, doesn't relate refugee status to one of the five grounds. So it can be something much more broad. So it's every person who, owing to external aggression, occupation, foreign domination, or events seriously disturbing public order, um, can seek refuge in another country. Um, and that definition is, is much broader than the Refugee Convention definition. So that you have to show a reasonable possibility that you would be persecuted or tortured if you were returned to your home country. It's not a certainty. It's not a, you don't have to, you can't prove that anything will happen 100% for sure in the future. So it's been determined through international law that all you have to show is a reasonable possibility. In the US, that's a one in 10 chance um, that you would suffer harm if you were returned to your home country. And you have to show that that fear is both subjectively genuine, so that you have that fear, that you're not just making up that you would be scared, that you really are scared, and also that it's objectively reasonable, so that the country conditions in that country um, show that because of who you are, if you were returned there, you would in fact um, face danger to your life. Um, so that's the first element. <coughs> the second element is persecution. You have to show that your government is either unable or unwilling to protect you from that harm. So um, if the government passes laws to say protect women against domestic violence, but those laws aren't enforced on the ground, the police can't stop husbands from beating their wives in the country, that person still has a claim to asylum because the government is unable to protect them from you then have to show a link between the harm that you suffer in fear, suffer or fear, and one of these five reasons that I talked about. So you have to show that the harm that you fear is on account of your race, your religion, your nationality, your membership in a group, or um, your political opinion, which I left off, but it's there. Um, you also have to show that you would not be barred from asylum. So you have to show that you um, haven't committed any grave war crimes, that you're not a criminal, you're not a terrorist. Three, that's how it should work. In practice, adjudicators, judges, asylum officers, protection officers in UNHCR, it's helpful if there is some, for some form of proof, so some form of corroboration to show that the person suffered what they say they suffered, or to show that they that what they say they fear will actually happen if they're sent back. Um, and this is coming about um, because uh, there are lots of news stories in the U.S. in the newspapers and the media about people making up claims for asylum, about fraud in the asylum system, and so I think that creates pressure on judges. Um, to figure out whether or not somebody is really telling the truth or not. How do you figure out if somebody's telling the truth or not? This is a very, very, very difficult question for judges. Um, and one of the ways in the U.S. that U.S. law has decided explaining what scars the person has and how those scars are consistent with the kind of injuries they say they sustained. Um, we also work with um, country experts who can show that uh, what the person says happened in their home country or they fear will happen in their home country is actually what's happening in their home country. Even though there might not be a lot written about it in the news media or in human rights reports. So for example, I had a case involving a gay man from the Congo. He fled to the U.S. He sought asylum. And as I was doing research to try to figure out what the situation for gay people was in the Congo, I realized that there was not much written on it. Perhaps because, this is about eight years ago, because at that time there were so many other human rights violations occurring in the Congo, human rights workers on the ground, that wasn't the issue they were focusing on, so there wasn't a lot written. And the U.S. State Department writes country reports every year you might have heard about analyzing human rights practices. Um, and the Congo report said there are no reports 
of discrimination against gay people in the Congo. Why? Right? Because nobody was documenting it. But when we were in court, the government said, the State Department says no reports of discrimination. That means they're fine. There is no discrimination. And we said, no, 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 that doesn't mean they're fine. It just means that the State Department hasn't talked to anybody who feels comfortable enough telling them what the situation's really like. So we had to get a country expert who could write a declaration saying, I know based on my field research that this is how gay people are treated in the <coughs> Um, without that, it would have been very hard to prove that what he said happened to him and what he said he feared was actually what was going on. Similarly, um, I had uh, two hunter and clients, a mother and a son. She had suffered um, 20 years of domestic violence before she fled to the U.S. And her memory of what happened to her during those 20 years was very confused. She remembered many different things that happened, but not when they happened because so many similar things that were terrible happened to her that they all sort of ran together. And I had to have a psychologist explain in an expert affidavit why her memories were so confused. How the fact that she hadn't gone to school meant that her timeline, the fact that she couldn't remember years and things in a linear sequence, how that might affect it, how her trauma might affect it. And so that kind of work with experts is the kind of proof that if you're lucky to have experts, you can help show um, why you help prove to the judge that your client is telling the truth. Which is another particular social group that's protected under their convention. So, for example, this mother and the son, they fled to the U.S. Her refugee claim was based on her domestic violence, but also based on the fact that her brother uh, was being targeted by gangs uh, for recruitment. They wanted her brother to join the gang, and her brother refused. Their family was evangelical Christian. They did not believe in the gangs. Her brother refused to join the gangs, and because he refused to join the gangs, the gangs targeted the rest of the family to put pressure on him to join. And so her refugee claim was also based on her family membership, her relationship to her brother. Um, and so, and she spoke out against the gangs. She told them to go away, not to bother her. And those were her political opinions that she expressed against the gangs. She told them she did not believe in them. Um, and she stood up to them. And in that way, she was also attacked. So she was, um, her refugee claim was based on many of the grounds that I've talked about. Political opinion, gender, family membership, religion. Um, so what is our grant rate in terms of asylum claims? How many people actually get asylum who apply in the US? It's about, any guesses? What do you think? 10%. 10%. Anyone else? Half. Half. Anyone else? 30. 30. Half, pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about 49%. Um, it ebbs and flows, somewhere between 40 and 50%. Um, get asylum, who apply for it. Um, and the process is a little complicated in the U.S. If you come to the U.S. with a tourist visa, or if you sneak in across the border and no one catches you, you can apply for asylum in front of the asylum office. And that is sort of like our version of UNHCR. You get an interview with an asylum officer. Um, there's no, it's non-adversarial. So they're supposed to not be there they're just supposed to try to find out your story. They're just supposed to figure out whether or not you meet the definition. Whether or not it's adversarial or not, that's a question. Um, but you, you have a chance to explain your story. And as lawyers, we can accompany our clients to those interviews, and we can make an argument for them at the end. But there's no lawyer from the government saying, no, 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 that person's lying. It's just the client, the officer, and the client's lawyer. If they lose in front of the asylum office, they can apply again in front of immigration court. They get another chance. And in court, there's a judge and there's a lawyer for the government. And that lawyer for the government asks the asylum seeker many questions to try to show that the asylum seeker is not telling the truth. Um, so it is adversarial. But they do get that second chance and um, they can win asylum at that stage. They get to tell their story all over again and the judge has to listen with a clean slate um, and can give them asylum. 
um, and they go through a very intense screening process. Um, and we've come under a lot of criticism for our screening process and for why we don't take more people, right? So for example, um, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees waiting to be resettled in other countries, and the U.S. this year has only taken a couple thousand. I think last time I checked it was 3,000. We've promised to take 10,000 by the end of the year, fiscal year, but, you know, who knows if we'll actually make that number. So that's just sort of a side note. There are other refugees in the U.S. Um, who get there and already have status. They don't have to go through any of this determination process that I've been talking about. Um, so why, why the crisis, right? Why, why is this, um, you know, why are we in a situation right now in the U.S. where we're feeling a lot of pain? Um, there was a, John Stewart, the comedian, had an episode about kids coming to the U.S. Should I show it? Okay. Um, we may end with this, because maybe then you'll have some questions about it, because I think we're running short on time. But um, he, in his episode, does a good job of explaining some of the fears um, of people living in the U.S. Um, about refugees. And I know everybody has been following what's going on with Donald Trump and the wall that he wants to build if he's elected. And so, you know, this is... The episode that I'm showing you is from a couple years ago. It's um, from 2014 when we first started seeing a big increase in the number of women and kids coming to the U.S. Um, but those same fears are still exist today, if not worse, because of the current <coughs> presidential campaign. Okay, so let's see if we can make this work. My uh, the U.S. has poured tremendous amounts of money into um, uh, enforcing the southern border and training Moroccan, uh, Mexican police to stop the kids from coming. So there used to be a, a pretty straight passageway to the U.S. on top of a train. Kids used to ride on top of trains to get to the U.S. to cross the border. Um, and just in the past year, they've created all of these barriers on, uh, to prevent kids from riding on top of those trains. So kids are now being forced to take um, much different, more dangerous routes through the desert um, to come to the U.S. because of this increased um, securitization of um, the border and um, you know the process of crossing uh, Mexico. And similarly, um, you know the, uh, Europe has invested a lot of money in, in keeping uh, <coughs> refugees from reaching its borders. And so I think there are some interesting similarities there um, in the two systems. So I think I'll stop. Um, so if you guys have questions.